the theme of the conference yesterday, which was sustainability and AI. Has your thinking changed at all um, on the interaction between the two? I feel that there's an awful lot of students who have shifted their concern. The number of entrepreneurs that we have, most of them are, as I say, leading towards like creating solutions that are sustainable. In the past, technology innovation has always resulted in us being more intelligent. And for the last 20 years, we are, by that metric, which probably has its flows, and you know, our intelligence is actually decreasing. So the idea of us transforming and you know, having AI all over the place in one go, you know, that's not gonna happen. Um, with AI, you are externalizing the brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is a game changer. But the good news is there's a new generation, but they're going to have to take responsibility uh, very soon. Mm. And they're going to have to deal with it. And yes, I mean, the problem that they're going to have to deal with are, you know, of a different magnitude than the problem we had to deal with. Hi, I'm Chris Caldwell, and welcome to Season 3 of Conversations on Climate. So much like, thank you so much for hosting us here today and uh, taking the time out of your very busy schedule to have a conversation on climate. Well, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. you know, it's great to be back at my, my alma mater, Trinity College Dublin. Always, always wonderful. Although the business school has moved at least twice since, uh, since I was here. It was when I was in the arts block. It uh, just shows, it just ages me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that was a while, but still you look young, so. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Before talking about your, you know, your current position as Dean of the Business School and, uh, the, and the research you've done, we'd like to get a little bit more of, um, of an idea about you as a, as a person, as a, as a kind of personality. Um, if you wouldn't mind trying to summarize um, your career to date in a single image, and why would you choose that image? Um, it's difficult to pick a single image, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, on, I'm almost 50, so, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm getting old. I'll tell you one thing, um, I think we're shaped by experience and sometimes by early experience. Um, and for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm from a middle class family, uh, but I went to school in, uh, in a working class uh, social housing area due to my family circumstances. and. You know, it's, it's in, a, in a neighborhood called La Roseray in, uh, in Angers, uh, one of the biggest uh, social estates in, in, in that town. And that has definitely shaped my uh, vision of the world and uh, my ethos. Uh, and I'm glad now to be in a position as Dean where I can actually use all of those blocks of experience, because obviously I evolved quite a bit uh, since then, um, to, to, to put things together. Um, so I don't have an image, but I do think almost weekly of back in those days and the neighborhood in which I, I, I went to uh, secondary school and I reflect on where I am now. And of course, I'm, I'm very happy with, with myself, although, as I say, I come from a middle class family, so the achievement is not that, that big. But, you know, there's a part of me uh, that was built there and that I'm bringing here. Uh, that's why, for example, I'm very keen on like our initiative Pathway to Business and the Trinity Access Program, um, because I really do think that like you know the social stratification of society are a big barrier and uh, a big impediment to the development of some wonderful individual. Right. And of course, another initiative is the uh, 2030 strategy, transforming business for good. You know, fan fantastic initiative and really kind of trailblazing in a in lot of ways. Um, you've only recently uh, become dean, and one of the first things that's happened was this 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 particular uh, initiative. Um, uh, one of the most notable parts of it is that um, the the climate emergency is is front and center. Like it is made made very clear that one of the one of the big purposes of this is to try to 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 frame and tackle this particular problem. But there's a lot of different pathways towards solving the problem. There's a lot of different views of what's good. There's lots of different views of views of what things can what things can and should be done. Um, what's your own view of the the, the transformational path uh, to climate from this? 
Um, so if you take like the old motto is transforming business for good. Now I have to give credit to my predecessor, uh, Andrew Burke, who uh, came up with uh, um, most of the element of this strategy and the slogan. I'm a marketing uh, professor myself and I do think that the slogan uh, transforming business for good is an excellent slogan because it conveyed the idea of transformation, constant adaptation um, and uh, also the notion of goodness which resonate with uh, our ESG agenda, uh, environmental, social and governance agenda. Um, and it actually, I think, resonate with the ethos of being Irish now. Obviously, I'm French, but you know that like uh, one thing that you may know is that Ireland, there's a goodness index that measure the impact of uh, a country can have on the goodness of the world not so much for their own people, which like something we could debate about the Irish states and the Irish uh, uh, society, but the contribution of the country to the rest of the world. And Ireland systematically rate like very high up when, the, when it first started that index, Ireland was number one. So I do think it resonates with the ito of uh, the Irish people. Um, it's good to be good, you know. Uh, there's an expression in, in, in France that people hate, uh, well, here hate, and it's like um, uh, trop gentil, trop con, and that means like too nice, too stupid. So in other words, and it, it really says something about the French mentality that you have to fight for your corner, and that if you're too nice, you're gonna get walked over, and therefore you're stupid. In Ireland, when I explain that expression, people are telling me it's good to be good. It's never, um, you know, it's never a bad thing. How can you say something like this is horrible? <laughs> to come back to our strategy. Um, there are three aspects, you know, uh, what are university and business school known for? Teaching, research, and then like any other business unit, we have our operations. So if you take, uh, and transforming business for good can mean different things, and I'll come back to this, but on the ESG uh, uh, aspect, you know, it's really about placing uh, environmental concern at the heart of those three elements. Um, so if you look at what we're trying to do uh, in research, we have the Trinity Center for Social Innovation. Um, we had the Go Nature Positive Initiative. Uh, it's a European project that was, uh, Trinity is a leader on. And um, it's really about placing nature at the heart of the business ecosystem so that the business ecosystem kind of uh, embrace and is uh, at ease and doesn't live off the resources of the natural world but actually is part of an ecosystem and brings a positive contribution. So that's one aspect and we have many other aspects that I'm happy to come back uh, on. Second aspect is teaching. So now it's like, you know, having a strategy is a good thing implementing a strategy is the other aspect. So we're really in the implementation phase. And in, in so far as teaching, uh, what we've done is conducting a review of all of our uh, undergraduate and postgraduate teaching and looking at like the extent to which ESG goals were um, included in the manual learning outcome. We assess every single discipline and we are now, uh, we've uh, identified some discipline on which we were very low. So for example, finance, only 10% of our modules had like an ESG concern. And we're gradually moving that up to a more, uh, a much more uh, uh, bigger level. And we introduced some new module like sustainable finance and things like that. And then to be coherent, you also need to pay attention to your operation. Now we're very lucky here, we're in a, almost net zero um, or low carbon emission building. Uh, but there are other aspects to our operation. Um, and actually, one of the main uh, issue is uh, our scope three emission, mm. which have, more, as you know, are related to business travel, which in our case relate to uh, student traveling to Trinity mm -hmm. to study. We're a very international school, especially at the postgraduate level. 70% of our student body are international. Half of those people come from outside of the EU. And the carbon footprint of this is something that we need to calculate and then try to mitigate. And that is, that is the key question. And in that 
in that aspect, that's where you see implementation of a strategy when you actually mean what you're doing becomes difficult because, of course, those students at postgraduate level brings an awful lot of revenue to the school and how you negotiate that. So, I mean, well, on, on that front, for example, uh, we're going to try, uh, we, we're going to experiment uh, something. Um, we need to assess uh, the, 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 the impact of counterbalancing the number of non-EU students who travel on, uh, on long flight, the impact that it has on our revenue, the impact or, that it has on our student diversity, the impact that it has on our overall mission, which is to educate um, you know, a very diverse population of people. So we're going to pick a program and we're also going to pick it a program and make some slight adjustment and see what are the cost of like, you know, redirecting or marketing towards like EU student, uh, uh, what are the, you know, cost benefit analysis. We're also going to use like a different protocol. So, you, you know, you've got the traditional uh, industry standards of CO2 uh, emission protocol that everybody's using. Uh, we're probably going to partner with the E-Liability Institute, uh, which is based in Harvard, and try to measure very precisely what are the, the, the CO2 emission of every single one of our students. Because you could have like a European student that actually travel every week to go back to France or Germany or every weekend. And, you know, certainly his carbon footprint will be less than, let's say, a Chinese student or an American student who just come here and, you know, take the train every time he goes to uh, mm -hmm. visit, uh, you know, the west of Ireland. So, yeah, those are complicated, but we're taking this very seriously. All primary mission and impact is on teaching. Mm -hmm. I'm using this example as operation. We know it's anecdotal, so I don't want to scare, like, you know, your viewer off and say, oh, like, you know, the dean is saying is not going to welcome any non-EU student because of the current footprint. That is not really the path that we're taking. We're taking one program, we're doing minor adjustments and trying to see what is the impact. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, um, we'll contrast that to overall mission, which is like really where we have an impact is in teaching and research. That's more important probably than just reducing an incremental decrease in our CO2 emission, which are... Mm -hmm by and large, by virtue of our industry, by virtue of our building, uh, by virtue of the country we live in, very, <laughs> very tiny in comparison to the overall amount that is produced in the world. Because Trinity is such uh, part of the, the fabric of our society, would be also having conversations with, with governments and with businesses and, like the, and the wider world. Um, how do you see the impact of the business school in that context? Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of like uh, society and like our impact at that level, um, there's two things. It has to do with some uh, very practical uh, research. Um, we, uh, you know, the nature of positive research has a lot of like uh, subdivision and we're look, looking with uh, local government on farming, on forestry. We have a lot of extremely practical project aim at like, you know, increasing the biodiversity of uh, forestation uh, while replacing and, and making it viable for the economic actor. And there again, of course, we are proposing like, uh, uh, you know, a new, uh, a new program in sustainable finance at the executive level. We have like a uh, postgraduate certificate on uh, sustainable development. Um, and we are gradually changing the makeup of our MBA to integrate more and more uh, ESG related module. Um, so we're gradually changing that makeup. And I think it would, you know, and, and actually I, I think it's going to work. It's going to work for the student, but it's also going to improve our ranking because ranking agencies are kind of uh, changing their dial and their, the, 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 the spectrum of what they are measuring. And they do now include, if you look at the Financial Times, for example, more and more uh, ESG. Uh, so ESG content is one of the criteria, which didn't exist a few years ago. Um, student body diversity is one of the criteria that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Um, operation, so the CO2 emission aspect that didn't exist. And on those three aspects, as well as value for money, actually, we rate really well. And so uh, that, that has led us to increase in the ranking. Uh, but we are going to move even further and maybe that will have a negative effect on our ranking. But we're confident that we could be uh, continuing that way and 
worst case scenario will be slightly ahead of the curve in terms of where the industry is going. Okay, so business schools have got a lot of, a lot of power to influence um, and so just taking particularly the influence they have on their students. So um, people, the young people come, come on in as, un, as undergrads and then as um, people who look to try and get postgraduate education, they want to have their, their business thinking formed. Um, what do you see the responsibility of Trinity is in trying to educate the next generation of leaders um, in, in the context of a world where faith in politicians is, is really at an all-time low um, and more and more people in society are looking towards businesses to be trying to solve problems, like to my mind, quite unfairly. <laughs> that really isn't their responsibility, but it's very difficult for uh, businesses to not be taking stances, uh, mm. to, me, to, be not, to not, not, not have opinions on, on things. Um, how do you tool up um, students? And do you think it's your responsibility to be, to be tooling up students to be dealing in this changed yeah, world where they've got, they've got extra responsibility? So, um, it, not only, yeah, it is, it, is, it is our responsibility, absolutely. And it is a great opportunity because mm. essentially, especially at undergraduate level, mm. when you come at an undergraduate, uh, in an undergraduate degree, you start when you're 18, you come out when you're 21, 22. Those are formative years. That experience is going to have a huge impact on um, the way you're going to behave um, throughout the rest of your life. So, of course, and that's why, like, you know, our undergrad, I mean, you know, former undergraduate students, as you would know, are very proud to be part of, uh, you know, an alumni and part of Trinity because it's a great institution. So what do we do? Uh, Specifically here, as I told you, like we have like monitored like the the, the number of, of modules that we're looking at ESG, we're increasing increasing um, in all of those disciplines. So if you take like finance, for example, it was very low. So now we've introduced like more module and undergrad like that actually assess and um, and uh, train students on 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 uh, new metrics in sustainable finance module. We, we have business ethics like, you know, uh, all across the board from undergrad to postgrad. Um, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, already and what was very uh, um, good about that exercise because sometimes you don't know it's a big organization, you don't know what you're doing exactly. I mean, you know what, you know, every single lecture has his own module outline and, and is working. But in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship, for example, 100% of our module already had like some sustainable element embodied in the module. So that was a very positive and that just shows like, you know, so that means that already anyone that is working in that area is addressing those concerns. Um, so yeah, we have a huge responsibility. We're working on it. We're piloting, the business school is piloting a new module, um, which is going to be called education and sustainable uh, development. But the main aspect of that module is that it's going to be piloted in the business school, rolled out across all uh, other program throughout Trinity. It's um, you know it's it's managed and piloted by Jane Stout that I think you have previously interviewed, uh, our vice president for biodiversity and climate action, and in that module it's cross disciplinary, and that's the other aspect because the problem we're trying to address are so complex that. You do need some business acumen, but it's very un unhelpful if you don't have some level of understanding of natural science, biology, uh, mm -hmm. some, some element of understanding of psychology. So we're doing this. Uh, I mean, it's never enough. Um, but the students are demanding that direction. The, only, the final thing I would say about this is that I know the students are sometimes a little bit at the angry and bitter, actually, about the state of the world. Mm -hmm. Economic development has been perceived as a great thing for many years. And, you know, this country, which was not mm -hmm. uh, economically developed like uh, before, uh, as developed as it is now, before the 90s, certainly can see the benefits of what has been going on for the last couple of years. Of course, the dial is changing. But the good news is there's a new generation, but they're going to have to take responsibility. Uh, very soon mm. and they're gonna have to deal with it and yes I mean the problem that they're gonna have to deal with are you know of a different magnitude than the problem we had to deal with we are trying we're passing the you know uh, the 
the stick if you want to uh, to the next the, generation the we're training stick. them well it's a burning <laughs> stick but like you know we are addressing it we're mm. transforming it it's 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 an organic process it's not like you know those guys were wrong and we're right you know mm. uh, we're all in the same boat um so yeah but there's mm. hope like you know the the the, the future generation is, is really going to drive those changes mm. and hopefully we're already equipping them to mm. be in a position to drive those changes yeah, yeah. But there is also a strong sense of responsibility on, on this generation to be trying to solve them. Of course. Because if we're waiting for another 20 years for the problem to be solved, it's, it's, it'll be too late by then. Exactly. Mm. And that's why I'm saying like our impact is like has to be immediate. So mm. we're working on MBAs, executive education. We're mm. working on some specific project. And our impact is also uh, in terms of like what do we do for the next generation and in terms of like helping them to... Mm. Uh, to go for jobs uh, in which they will be in a position to uh, to solve those issues. There's a real demand for a sense of purpose. Uh, mm. I feel, you know, uh, we've been talking about this again at the Trinity Business Forum, but, you know, the, 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 the old model of like watching the movie Wall Street and like, you know, greed is good and like people want to make some money. Of course, there are some students who still want to make some money and there's nothing wrong with wanting to do some money. But the, I feel that there's an awful lot of majority uh, of students who have shifted their concern towards like, you know, promoting something uh, that is good. And even the number of entrepreneurs that we have, most of them are, as I say, leading towards like creating solutions that are sustainable. Yes, if they can make some money along the side, I mean, you know, happy days, but they go right in. And, you know, they're not necessarily going to take like a very high paid job in the financial sector. They, you know, the proportion are shifting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good news. Yeah, it's you interesting. Know? Yeah. And noticed in talking to people yesterday and admittedly, it was a, a self-selecting group who would, to, who would come to uh, sustainability and um, artificial yeah. intelligence conference. But it appeared to me that the, um, the undergrads and the postgrads, PhDs, whoever I was, I was talking to over the day were... There, it wasn't a, an aspiration that they were going to be taking on a job that aligns with the purpose. It was an expectation. It was just taken as read that mm. this is what they're going to do, which is really quite like for, from someone who was of a different generation where um, where sustainability wasn't part of, of the of the agenda at all. Um, I think we had something vague, a vague nod at CSR, you know, but nothing, nothing, nothing of the the level level it is now. So it, it's it, it's a very large transformation, and um, but and you say you've seen that across across as a general rule across the across the school. Oh, across? Yeah, totally. I mean, we know that the system is partially broken. You know uh, that uh, shareholder capitalism as it has. Um, taking place for the last 40 years is not fully working. We know that there's a wealth um, distribution issue, mm -hmm. uh, a huge one mm -hmm. uh, that has never been as big as like uh, as it is right now in terms of, you know, wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, we, and we also know that there is like a systemic cr uh, crisis when it comes to our natural resources and uh, biodiversity mm -hmm. and, and climate. So, mm -hmm. Like the problem for some for someone like me and some every single one of us is how do we operationalize like you know uh, those uh, those those problem into opportunities and then into something that is tangible on the ground. Mm -hmm. What I found very reassuring is that if you look at like the the top company, the most profitable or the most valued company in the world, thirty years ago. Ten, uh, uh, seven out of ten would have been petroleum company. Mm. Today, it's all the tech, mm -hmm. right? The Apple, the Google, and uh, of this world. But when I see the wave of entrepreneur that is coming through our ranks, that are systematically focusing on sustainable uh, solution, and I'm not like a tech fanatic saying like all the solution uh, to all problem are going to come from innovative company and technology that are you know going to mm -hmm. capture the carbon and you know somehow manage to recreate some level of decent biodiversity but they will have an impact and the new generation is going that way and, and again i come back to the point about 
um, you know, the number of modules that we are to talk about sustainability, it resonates with the student because they actually tend to come out and create their own company that are going to really specifically address uh, some of those issues. We have lots of small projects where undergrad are showcasing, you know, what could be a good idea. Most of them, if not all of them, are about creating a more sustainable future. Um, but before I move on from this, I think there's one kind of interesting point that you, you made um, that I'd like to dig. Did you say that there was um, a, an ethics course within, the, 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 within your, the business school? Oh, yeah. yeah. There, there was, so basically, we have, I, I mean, I don't know if, we, but I mean, I'm sure other business schools are doing the same, but uh, in virtually all of our program, there is a, a business ethics module mm -hmm. or some type of, um, or a module that relate to business ethics might not have exactly that name. Mm. Uh, so that's true at undergrad level and that's also true at uh, postgraduate level. Now, I think that's a really good approach, but we need to be careful about like uh, having that type of approach. So it's not, in a, in a way, it's not sufficient. So it's good to have this, but it's, you know, there's no point having a business ethics module if you just like go into, um, you know, derivatives and capital market and say like, okay, the way you do money is this and, you know, you have mm. absolutely no metrics for the environment that can be completely discounted. And then you have, oh yeah, but you know, think of ethics, it just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. So you need to have both, you, know, you obviously you need to have a student that prepare them for the world we live in. So we're teaching students how to, uh, you know, uh, manage funds and, you know, do uh, market, uh, do digital marketing, use business analytics. Uh, but we're trying, as I said, to embody the ESG. And on the same time, we have like, you know, more specific climate action or ES, uh, certainly uh, business ethics modules on governance uh, that are uh, kind of proposed to all of our students. Okay. And um, kind of one kind of final question is this part. Uh, it's it is it's a journey. It's a process, um, and you'll play like a very important role in over over the the next few years. Um, what would you like to see at the end of your time as dean here? What what change would you like to have seen have happened over the period? So for me, it's really about the implementation of mm. that strategy and making sure that everybody's on board. I mean, you know, like any organization, it's a collective adventure. So, you know, you, you have to bring people along with you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm always worried about like a leader that is, has a vision. Uh, you know, he runs in that direction only to realize that, you know, uh, <laughs> nobody has left, left the dock behind him. So rather than having a vision, uh, I have, um, I'd, I'd like to bring a sense of purpose, a purpose for everything that we do. And maybe that resonates with the way I've managed my career. I never expected myself to be, I didn't wake up and say, I'm going to become the dean of Trinity Business School. It became slowly and, and organically. And, uh, and I think there is, you know, you take things at a, ta at a time and you don't, you don't over promise. Um, what you achieve on, on, on an everyday level. So we do have a strategy and we have a couple of metrics. I actually am more reluctant to advertise them publicly. Mm -hmm. I would like to, you know, keep it for myself and keep moving like this. Uh, but certainly what, we, what I'd like, you know, for the, this business school to be is to be perceived as a leader in ESG, uh, but also the other aspect that we haven't talked about too much and that was the topic of yesterday conversation and a lot of initiative is that we want to stay on the top of things. So AI is now, according to the latest McKinsey um, survey, a top priority for CEOs. The argument that we were developing is that it is a priority. It's certainly today's priority. It shouldn't be the number one priority. The number one priority should for me, always and will always be, as long as we haven't solved this issue, and it looks like it might take more than one generation, mm -hmm. on sustainability. But business schools have a duty to stay relevant, and AI is is a huge, it has a massive implication for the way for the way we teach. So on our industry, for the way the students are learning, uh, there's a risk of de-skilling, and so we need to prepare ourselves on this. So we're uh, having a couple of initiatives, and the mode of delivery as well can help us. 
Earlier, I mentioned the fact that we have CO2 emissions that are related to student traveling here. We could propose more of our module online or in a blended mm. fashion. And that would, that would have two benefits. First of all, it would uh, mean that we can outreach to new market. And second, uh, it also means that it will reduce our CO2 emission. I mean, it's a four year term and, you know, possibly another four years after. So I'm going to take it step at a time. I just hope that on ESG, on innovation and digitalization, which are part of our metrics, we would have progressed substantially from where we are now. And if we do that, from a market point of view, if you want to use that word, we will be in a better position, we'll be better ranked, we'll be uh, better renowned. Um, where would we be? You know, will, will I tell you I want to be the leader in this? No, I'm never going to tell you this. We're just going to take it step at a time and the, the rest will follow, in my opinion. An interesting point there about uh, wanting to be um, looking at both what is core and what is going to be kind of obviously generationally important, which is sustainability, making sure the planet is is, is going to be around for generations in the future, but also like the current hot topic, which is which is AI. Um, universities have got a responsibility to be um, sharing. They've got a responsibility to, to society to be uh, on top of the hot topics, but they've also got a responsibility as particularly something as a, a, a university as, as, as old and storied as Trinity to be providing wisdom and knowledge, which can take time. It doesn't happen overnight. Like you need to be need to be to be expending energy and taking time over it. But if you take too much time, you can you can miss the hot topic. But if you are too reactive, um, you can be re retooling your entire university towards the metaverse and then suddenly feeling a little bit silly. <laughs> you know? how, do you, how do you manage the balance between the hot and the, um, and the responsibility to providing wisdom? And so, to be honest, it's not too much of an issue, the balancing act. And I'll tell you what, uh, why, is because public organization, and any, organi any big organization actually, to mm -hmm. be honest, is relatively slow to change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have uh, a team of like uh, 60 academic, uh, we have like more than 100 like adjunct professor, you know, every single one of them have some level of academic freedom and every single one of them is teaching a curriculum and is used to teaching it in a certain way. So the idea of us transforming and, you know, having AI all over the place in one go, you know, that's not going to happen. So, so, the so the fundamentals that you were describing in an institution that is more than 500 years old are there. We know about the fundamentals and we'll keep teaching about the fundamentals. I'm not worried about that. What I'm trying to do is to say, okay, where are those adjustments? And so there's some modules that need to be introduced, uh, some modules that need to be let go, and course yeah, that, that creates some friction uh, sometimes mm -hmm. um, and with regard to AI I think the challenge is more about our pedagogical approach and it's going to become increasingly difficult. AI is, is a game changer because throughout humanity we have externalized our capabilities and that's fine you know from having papers that didn't exist, you know, in the before at the beginning of the ancient Greek time where, you know, people had to rem remember everything that was being said by a lecturer and therefore develop their, um, you know, cognitive ability in terms of uh, ability to um, memorize things. And of course that shrink, and, but, you know, there were other abilities then when you started to read through print, mm. you know, um, and that, that developed other part of the brain. Um, with AI, you are externalizing the brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is a game changer. So, uh, the, and, and, and already since the advance of mobile technology, we've seen a decrease in the average IQ of the population in the Western world. This is the first time since the Enlightenment. You know, um, in the past, technology, innovation, has always resulted in us being more intelligent. And for the last 20 years, we are, by that metric, which probably has its flows, and, you know, 
our intelligence is actually decreasing. And I am worried that with AI, you get like a big drop. Mm. You're going to have students who get an essay, plug it into AI, mm. submit it to their lecturer, who submit it to AI for correction. So basically you have two artificial intelligence systems speaking to each other. It might actually be the same AI. So we need to be very careful about that. And so we're introducing uh, a module uh, for all of our faculty. Um, it's in preparation, teaching with AI. Uh -huh. So I know the words like, what are the methods of assessment and what can we do to increase the cognitive ability of our student while they are using it? And there are some initial evidence that if you do use it in a conversational mode where every um, time you input something, you get an output that makes you react and you kind of re-input something and you kind of build up and refine your strategic and your thought in that conversational mode. But if you just give the assignment and spur it back, then there's a loss of motivation for learning because what's the point? Mm. I mean, AI is just going to give me the answer. Um, and there's a loss uh, in their ability to, um, uh, to uh, solve problems. So that's going to be an issue, and it's going to be even more of an issue when we're going to get in 20 years from now students who are currently being trained at the age of 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10 years old on using generative AI. Mm -hmm. So that has just started last year. We've seen the effect of social media and mobile phone 20 years on. We gave those tools, the iPad and other, and I'm guilty of it like every single parent, to our children. 20 years on, which is more or less the time we're in, 2005, 2025, we have an epidemic of psychological issues with regard to the new generation. So what is it going to be for AI? We need to really make, be mm -hmm. very embracing this technology because it's there, but you know, uh, be aware of how to use it because there's some dangers there. Mm, absolutely. Um, so, it, yeah, very, really interesting points uh, you make, which I guess leans towards the theme of the conference yesterday, which was sustainability and AI, like the, the interactions. Um, did you, has your thinking changed at all um, on the interaction between the two after the conference yesterday? <laughs> um, no, uh, no, not fundamentally. Um, I, I thought what was pretty amazing from the conference. Well, I mean, okay, the purpose of the conference was to bring actually two types of audience together. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are tech fanatic and they say, you know, AI is great and like, you know, it's going to be this and it's going to do that and it's going to solve this problem and that problem. And of course, I have some people in my faculty who are like this, you mm -hmm. know, and there are some people who are all about sustainability and, you know, uh, we need to do this and we need to change the system. And they're kind of like, AI is like, well, well, that's another evil, like, you know, let's ignore it. But, but you can't ignore it. It's mm -hmm. there. So the purpose of that conference was to kind of mix the two teams. Um, of course, there's, there's an awful lot of confusion as to what is AI, what is generative AI, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to enter that debate, but technology in general. Uh, and uh, no, I, I think, you know, I think, I think what struck me from yesterday's conference is that... Um, we had people from the private sector, academic, uh, we had activists, uh, we had students. And I think what was very refreshing uh, in a way is that the, everyone was relatively aligned. Mm -hmm. You know, there's need to be um, some consciousness in the sustainability aspect in terms of consumer, company, uh, change of metrics. Uh, there needs to be some accelerator in terms of like governance role in regulation. Mm -hmm. It's very important. On both of them topic, regulation needs to happen. Uh, it's more difficult obviously on AI because it's kind of in the making. But on sustainability, there's an awful lot that is coming up. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be more regulation. You know, it, it is... I'm a, like everyone, I'm a big user uh, of, uh, of generative AI. You know, I have uh, my license for... Um, for chat GPT, I use it, I can see the benefit of it, it has increased my productivity quite a bit. Maybe you could argue it was quite low, but you know. <laughs> uh, but 
it's, uh, you know, it is disturbing that a, a tool that has such profound effect potentially on humanity has been released like this with mm -hmm. relatively minimum safeguard, if any safeguard, mm -hmm. and thrown in the hands of the public and private companies kind of wa wa washing their hands of it and say, yeah, you use it, you know, whatever. Mm. And, you know, um, yes, uh, I, 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 was, I was surprised to see that a lot of people in the industry, even the tech industry, were kind of saying, well, yeah, you need mm. to be careful, mm. you know. So. Yeah, yeah. So another uh, one of your, your areas of expertise is kind of digital marketing, digital, digital branding platforms. Sure. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the kind of move fast and break things um, yeah. attitude towards um, you know, these, these various platforms, uh, Facebook, um, Twitter, X, has not resulted in entirely positive outcomes. So in looking at bringing kind of the the likes of uh, Facebook and Twitter, X, the kind of the social media media companies back into the conversation about, about AI. It's a lot of the same players who are looking to dominate both uh, both spaces. Um, and their track records from being enormously successful and popular and seen as like the savers of humanity, then got hit by scandals, be it like Cambridge Analytica, be it uh, troll farms, be it you know the various spats that come up between you know, Donald Trump and um, Elon Musk and whatever. Um, it seems that trust in those platforms is very low as well. So one question out of that, which related to AI is, why have we found it, even in the context of us not trusting anymore, why are we finding regulations so hard to, to impose upon these, these big players? It's a, it's like, you know, obviously there, there's been the debate as to whether or not like those platform were mere, uh, platform, i.e. they are not broadcasters. Mm -hmm. They are not responsible for the content that they produce because they are a multi-sided platform. So in other words, you have like users on one side, which can be individual users or, uh, companies they provide the content mm. and then on the other side you have users individual users who consume that content and the whole argument and one of the reasons they developed so quickly is that they kind of deny any responsibility and so the, the the only about the content that was being presented that it's all organic and at best we have an algorithm that is going to shift what we believe based on your preferences, your click-through rate, and all of those things, the content that you're more likely to engage with. And of course, we're doing this for your own good because you know you want you know, something that is interesting. But the reality is, of course, they do it also because um, the more I feed you what you want, the more you're gonna engage. And you know, it's the economy of attention, so then like, you know, you have that situation where children, for example, my children, if I cap with like the, I have like the parental control on two hours, the use of their mobile phone, but like I'm the, I am the worst dad, parents, because my wife is very keen as well, obviously. Uh, we're the worst parent on earth. You know, nobody does that. And of course, some other people do that. Uh, but yeah, so, so there is, you know, so, so, so certainly, uh, we're not we're not that impressed with uh, with that narrative. Uh, those platforms are highly addictive, uh, mm -hmm. and and that's 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 a problem. Uh, how do you regulate it? Uh, well, I you know I think I think we need to be. I I'm, I'm going to shock. But look at, uh, I mean, China is certainly not the example to follow for many things, but they are you know. They are uh, blocking uh, from the uh, providers, uh, sorry, network provider side, the use of social media to one hour per citizen. Mm. Now, it's China. They have a vision. They enforce it. Um, I, you know, there used to be regulation where uh, in the past you couldn't, you had like so many channels that were available on the Ertian channel. Some programs were not allowed to be, pro uh, you know, uh, projected on those channels. So any, anything that has to do with pornography or anything like that was completely banned. 
and everybody so that's normal and then we have a system where all of those things are freely accessible porn being one but like there's many other uh, site and information and things that are freely accessible and somehow that's okay mm. so what was very normal and not perceived as undemocratic whatsoever done for the good of the society yesterday through the TV channels was fine and imposing regulation, drastic regulation on uh, social media in terms of at least the level of exposure uh, because the problem is if you start controlling the content mm -hmm. then, then you get into a debate where democracy is in danger but if you start to control the level of exposure, what's the harm? Like, I mean, what is the social benefit of being on your mobile phone for four, five, six, mm. seven hours a day? Which are the figures that we, that some of our children are, um, are experiencing that technology? What is the benefit for them? Mm -hmm. What is the benefit for society? Mm. And why are we not regulating this? Now, of course, like, you know, people are going to say, I'm absolutely nuts, but we're, we're like, I really would like to understand where is the problem in limiting the exposure? Mm. Well, I suppose if you're going to be trying to uh, play devil's advocate, you could say that, well, what, where do you draw the line? What is, what is social media? What isn't? Like, is LinkedIn social media? Do I spend more than an hour on LinkedIn a day? Not every day, but sometimes. Um, I, like, I never look at, other, at no, others, yeah. but yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm using it as an example, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, of course, yeah, like, yeah. you know, this, this is not an easy solution, and if such, uh, uh, I don't think that's the direction things mm. are going anyway, so I'm, mm. I'm, I'm speaking freely from mm. my, uh, from what is only mm. my opinion, and I don't, uh, don't pretend to reflect anyone else's opinion on that matter, mm. but, you know, I would consider, I, I find it fascinating sometimes that we don't have even a debate about mm. this. Mm. You know, what is the social benefit uh, of this mm. tool? Mm -hmm. And does that require regulation if the cost-benefit analysis reveal that actually there's more cost than, uh, than benefit? Mm. I mean, and there's always a lag effect. You mm. have to remember, you know, um, cigarettes were good for you uh, mm -hmm. until the, you know, in, in the 50s. Mm. Guinness was, uh, you know, was given to a mother who were uh, just having a children to get a little bit more iron in their, in mm. their system. Um, wine was served uh, at the canteen in France uh, until the, the, the in, in, still in the, until the early 60s. In my high school, we were allowed to smoke in, 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 uh, in the building, actually, we had a smoking room uh, from the age of 15. Like, you know, fast food mm -hmm. was like great until mm -hmm. now we realize it's not that great. And, you know, level of sugar, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the point I'm making is mm -hmm. that as we are discovering the uh, arm to society that some of those technical technological tools and platform are doing, mm -hmm. regulation will need to come mm -hmm. because otherwise what's the outcome and what's, you know, mm -hmm. you know, does raising the price of cigarettes impede people's freedom? Yes, mm -hmm. it does. Mm -hmm. You know, does mm -hmm. preventing like people from smoking in a building impede people's freedom? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Is anybody, does anybody has a problem with it mm -hmm. now? Mm -hmm. No. no yeah. I'm saying in the future, mm -hmm. And hopefully sooner rather than later, mm. some regulation will have to come. Sure. I'm, I'm just <laughs> waiting for someone to explain to me what is the social benefit of a kid of between the age of uh, mm. uh, four years old to the age of like 18 uh, or six, whatever, spending six hours on YouTube or TikTok uh, per day. Mm. I, I literally do not see any benefit for the person mm -hmm. and so for society. No, no, and that's, sure. that's just yeah. for me, I'm sorry, but that's, that's just a reality. And uh, because it's a new material, mm. we're very reluctant to do anything about it. Mm. But the, like the Chinese are doing something about mm. it. Mm. And yeah. They're just yeah. doing sure. it. I, I mean, I'd like to, if, if it was a free society, I'd like to go and talk to some Chinese people and say, what has happened? <laughs> you know, are you better off? Is it like the, the, mm. the Australian gun control mm. stuff? Are you better off now or do yeah. you regret? It brings me back to, um, it was a good skill when I was in school to be able to learn how to um, do long division. But I knew when I was in school, I was learning how to do long division, that it was, it was to uh, train a muscle as yeah. opposed to me actually having to do that. Now, 
in your daughter's world, maybe your daughter's daughter's world, will she be learning how to write with the knowledge that she'll never have to do it because AI will do it for her? Yeah, so that's mm. the thing, and I, uh, that's why again I think like you know um, those tools are important. Uh, I think we should never prevent um, the innovation from mm. taking place. Uh, so regulation needs to be very careful about that. At the same time, we should not be shying away from preventing the usage of some of those tools in uh, a specific area. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, you know, there, there's a real risk of this killing, mm -hmm. at, like fun, like a, a, a huge risk. And actually, if if you know human nature, it's it's not a risk. It's almost a, it's almost a certainty that you know, if the future generation has access to generative AI on a daily basis, and if all mode of um, of, uh, of teaching does not account for this, then of course like the, what we're teaching becomes meaningless and they are not going to learn anything. We're mm -hmm. going to be teaching something that they are not going to learn. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be that discrepancy. So there's two solutions. Either you embrace the technology and you say, okay, or use AI, but use it in this way. And in some instances, don't use AI. Just like remember when you were doing your exam when you were a kid, and sometimes the calculator, you had to leave it. Mm -hmm. So you had like your exam mm -hmm. and no calculator. It's going to be the same. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, there are some domain that fundamental you need to say no. No use of technology, paper and pen, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you know. Um, and then there's some instances where, well, no, use your calculator. And it's going to be the same with AI. Use AI to do it this way. Explain to me how you use it, how it refines your things, and then like add, have a, almost like a meta exercise on how you explain how it has helped you to come up with an answer, how it has improved your answer. I mean, and again, we don't have all the pedagogical tools because it's in the making. It's literally came out last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm. when you think of uh, our ability to adapt, uh, you know, but yeah, so, uh, so th that's, that th there's a real danger and we need to do something about, and that's why when I say like, you know, climate action is important, AI, we cannot ignore it. You mm -hmm. know, this is, it has fundamental uh, uh, implications. And yeah, and uh, you know, in, in other words, that's what we're doing, trying to do at the business school, combining, you know, our mm -hmm. concern for sustainability, integrating AI into our pedagogical approach, mm -hmm. integrating AI in what we are actually teaching, business analytic, data analytic, you know, um, all of those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So if we could just have one last uh, question, because we, we always end by asking for a little piece of advice, you know, for, for, for the audience. Uh, so in this case, I'm kind of pulling together a couple of threads that you've been, you've been um, talking about there. One was that uh, communication is only important if you can get your, if, if people are listening. Yeah, uh, there's if you know we can have the, the best message, message in the world, but um, if no one's listening, it's it, if they're there and listening. If they're there and, yeah, and, they're and listening, um, and there's I'm sure that all of our listeners will have had some challenges in getting their, their messaging out, particularly in the climate space. Like it, it can be it can be challenging to get your ideas and like your core beliefs out, out into the world. Uh, what advice would you give to people who are trying to get their um, their their core beliefs? in relation to kind of brand and communication out to, to a wider public? Um, brand is about trust. I mean, you, you can Google and, and listen to Steve Jobs talking about brands and, you know, it really, uh, in a nutshell, is about trust mm -hmm. and is about doing what you say you're going to be doing. It's about delivering on your promises. Uh, so, um, so the messaging is about authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, it's like, what was it? It's like, a, <laughs> if you're, you're good at, you know, the most important part for an actor is authenticity. And, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and you're, you become a good actor when you manage to fake it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. So, um, no, let's not take that cynical view. Um, 
the most important aspect is authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if you're true to your values, if you, are tr if you literally say what you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, then you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then, then actually you don't mind being accused of greenwashing because you know, you're right in your boots, you know, you, know, mm -hmm. you know what you're doing. You're not, you're not concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know you're doing something with a purpose. Uh, if, you know, if the accusation of green rushing is, is, is bothering you, well, you know, maybe, maybe there is a limit of that. So, uh, yeah, so just be true to your value and, uh, and convey it in the most uh, appealing manner to your audience, just like any marketing 101 will tell you um, and whether or not, like, uh, by using the most appropriate uh, platform as to where your audience is. That's okay. all. Great. Uh, hasn't changed. Still very simple. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. It's a really great conversation. Thank you so much. That was great. great. Thank, you so much. Thank you very much for joining us on that conversation. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you uh, learned something. If you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and to subscribe to any of our channels and we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. These are conversations that you just can't afford to miss.